So, yeah, welcome everyone. Thank you, Carson. Um, this is a, a public event uh, discussion forum, but it's also a launch of a project called Open Earth Monitor Cyber Infrastructure, or shortly, earthmonitor.org, the domain. Um, so we're very happy to have you here. There's also people following online, and uh, it's um, almost a 14 million euro project uh, we just kickstarted, uh, 1st of June, and it will run for four years with a, a 21 partner. And we are very enthusiastic. We are very humbled to be uh, to be doing things for European citizen, global citizen, and to be uh, being funded by the European Commission uh, within this uh, governance um, uh, cluster. Um, and you can find all about the project, of course, on our website, more or less. But we just kickstarted, so don't expect you will see something cooked or ready to be served. So it's just a kickstart. Um, we took this photo yesterday. We had a really fruitful discussion yesterday we were here. And uh, we also discovered many of the participants of the Open Earth Monitor are ex wageningen and University um, graduates. So uh, please raise your hand, whoever finished the uh, study at Wachen University, just to see. So you see many, many participants there, ex-graduates. Uh, so it's uh, symbolical also we are here. And you see, um, you don't have to go anymore to Mediterranean country to enjoy the heat. Um, we are very lucky actually to be here today because they have a very nice cooling system. So we, we really save you from the uh, heat outside. Uh, oh, yeah, by the way, we are about 80 people, um, as I said, 21 organizations from 50 plus countries, and we also go beyond Europe, so we have also colleagues uh, from different continents. Um, and Open Geohub is the lead. Uh, we, we started it, we started, the, we led the proposal, and um, but it's together with uh, also with Bach University here, and I'm so grateful that you are helping us uh, host this event. And uh, we will not build a new, uh, many people ask me, hey, are you guys building a Google Earth engine, European Google Earth engine? And I said, no, uh, we are lead slightly smaller in budget than what Google has. So uh, I think it's not realistic, but who knows, maybe we'll, maybe we'll get extra creative. Uh, but we will build up on top of things. So what we're trying to make is a federation of tools that already exist. We would like to integrate them and build the bridges so the use of these tools becomes seamless. And also, once we do that, we would like to demonstrate that by building actual data sets uh, that we think uh, will be user-driven and it will be, they will be ready for decisions. So that's what we hope for. But we're going to build on top of existing uh, technology, then extending it, connecting it, and um, uh, building a kind of integrated solutions. So that is the that is the the goal basically. And uh, one large group in our project is from the Open EO project, for example. Uh, and also, there we are lucky to have Synergize, uh, who is one of the leading providers of Earth observation services in Europe from Slovenia. And so we're very lucky to have Grega and Synergize also with us, and the Brockman Consult with their Euro Data Cube. Uh, so yes, we're very happy also to have commercial sector. Uh, and uh, entrepreneurs also joining, and they did sign up to uh, help also make open data. So we did sign a consortium agreement that specifically says we will produce open data following the Open Knowledge Foundation uh, conformant licenses. So we will uh, be strictly open, um, uh, with the exception that because European Commission pays only 70% uh, to the SMEs, so the SMEs have a opportunity to uh, spend 30% of the budget on also on closed source and closed data. Um, this is example GBIF, uh, 2 billion records. It's waiting, it's all there. These are just points, right? There's nothing from these points. I mean, it's amazing system GBIF, but to, to make you know something for people that they can understand and see and use and see, for example, uh, dynamics of some species or some biodiversity index or things like that, you know, it's still far away. So what we want to do is we want to grab something like that, which is prepared, it's ready, it's massive, two billion records. Uh, and we would like to run, run uh, cutting edge machine learning on this data to extract 
additional value added uh, data sets that we think if they are served easily and if they are if we manage to boost the accuracy and if we manage to bring the, the really cutting edge technology and uh, statistics and machine learning, that we can produce really value-added data sets. Um, software also we're going to release under the open source initiative, approved licenses, so that's usually MIT or uh, uh, Apache or BSD. Uh, so we will also release also most of the software as open source. And, and that's why we, are, we think we're allowed to be called Open Earth Monitor Project. Um, objectives of the project, very simple. I tried to see, like there's a long list we had in proposal, like two pages, but now just very simple keywords. We want to first find out what are the bottlenecks, why people have issues with data. We look, for example, that's why we call you keynotes here. We want to listen from you. We want to understand what is from your perspective a bottleneck. Uh, especially organizations like Geosecretariat, UNCCD, uh, also European Commission institutions. What are the bottlenecks? What, why, did, why is data not used? What slows down applications? Then we will build up a, a open source software tools, uh, what we call a computing engine. Uh, we will integrate as much as possible. We make it seamless. It should run through API, so it's uh, basically language agnostic uh, that people only really have to uh, understand the steps they want to apply. And then we will build data sets, data portals for Europe and for the world. We will build two systems. Europe is different than the world, of course, so you will build one system for the world, one system for Europe. We'll also learn how to integrate European, uh, European data with global data, which is also complex. Um, then we would like to use the FAIR principles. We would like to do reproducible research, so when we produce some predictions of land cover, biomass, I don't know, that we can also show to everyone how did we make this uh, from beginning to the end, uh, so full reproducibility. Um, and then we would like to focus on the use cases. We want to serve these concrete use cases, mainly focus on uh, European Green Deal, EuroGeo, um, and also uh, European Open Science Cloud. So this is in a nutshell, and I think uh, most of you know about European Green Deal. But I would just like to mention that it is a great opportunity. It's, a, it's now, of, um, I don't know how many years already that's been approved, uh, but it's a great opportunity. And we are all, all in this together, uh, entrepreneurs, policymakers, uh, users, we are all in this together. Uh, climate change, global degradation of environment is one of the biggest challenges of our time. So, uh, so we're looking enthusiastic to that. When we wrote the proposal, we read, we did a homework, we read the literature, and one of the key papers we used is the paper from Julia Wagemann, uh, who's also our dear colleague, uh, and she teaches in our summer schools. Um, and she li she listed these five, um, what what she find out through interviews, kind of what sticks out as a five limiting uh, uh, aspects of uh, big earth data. Uh, so limited processing capacity on user side, growing data volumes, non-standardized data formats, too many data portals, difficult data discovery. And this is, you know, it's very simple. People do this very thorough diligence and they say, these are the problems. And now we just convert that into, well, these are the problems. Let's go one by one, break it into pieces and let's test things out and see if we can resolve issue by issue. Um, so we uh, build up the proposal uh, based on four key premises. Uh, I will talk about them one by one. Uh, but the first premise is that the uh, problem with the data that usually a classical uh, problem is that the data is not decision ready. And there's been a lot of things written on the, in blogs and on, on if you follow on Twitter. And one of the one of the recent uh, posts that kind of uh, is uh, being uh, viral going around, it's called "Nobody Wants Your Fancy Algorithm." Please read it. Basically, it says that today there's so much flashy landing pages for Earth observation data, but it's a very little things that is ready for people to make decisions, people on the ground. Uh, so. Um, the other excellent, excellent uh, podcast is uh, by uh, Joe Morrison, the vice president of uh, Umbra. Um, he has this podcast called The Problem with Satellite Data is that it's not a commodity. So you have these amazing new uh, missions, European uh, Copernicus uh, missions, 
and satellite system. There's more and more satellite systems coming, you will hear in the other talks. But what happens is that it's very little, it's been done by industry. So it's a usage is, I think, maybe 10, 20% of potential. So uh, that's another big problem. Uh, this example of Landsat, uh, Landsat data, we, we work with the GLAD Landsat uh, at Open Geo Hub for about three years now. We work with GLAD Landsat. Uh, we did, uh, we processed Europe. Uh, what we discovered is amazing data set. You can go back to 1997, let's say. Um, and so you can really analyze what's happening at 30 meter resolution uh, globally. But as I said, we focus on, on Europe. So what we discovered when you look at the data, the whole data set is about two and a half petabyte. Um, so we cannot download it easily. I mean, obviously that, that wasn't the, that wouldn't work, but so we downloaded Europe. Then once we download, we notice that, yeah, well, there's all these clouds, there's missing values, there's artifacts. So we find that, okay, we cannot work with that. So then we had to do our own processing to get uh, all the temporal composites um, and then prepare data as a proper data cube. So complete, consistent, no, no missing values, no clouds. Once you compress it, then you come to 20 terabyte. So instead of having, I don't know, five, half petabyte, you come to 20 terabyte, and then it becomes uh, usable. This is example NDVI. Uh, so uh, after you filter out all the missing values, gap filling, uh, then you can uh, you can visualize. This is in our data portal called uh, EchoDataCube.eu. Uh, so that's the. Um, one step to make the data more usable. That's another example, Sentinel-1. Recently, paper in scientific data, they published a paper, they made the Sentinel-1, seasonal composites, whole world. Um, this is Wageningen, and this is on 100 meter, uh, sorry, 100 meter resolution, uh, different layers, I'm just zooming in. Uh, when you go and download this data set and you visualize it, you see there's huge gaps, there's, there's lines, there's artifacts. Um, so then you go like, well, we cannot, we cannot use that really. This, you have to still put an effort to make that really analysis ready. Um, the other thing which is important, the other premise is the, um, the uh, what is called in this article, climate action will not stall until the finance problem is solved. I look at many applications where excellent scientists using top technology develop solutions, but there's no financial analysis. There's no per pixel estimates of what are the gains, what are the losses. Uh, so the, our, our capacity to do financial analysis is very limited in geoinformatics, and that's something we would like to improve. Um, and this is something that pops up now, I think, on internet, the, the web telescope, right? Uh, and it's amazing, you people, you know, they made this telescope, they zoom in back into, I don't know, 14 billion years ago. Um, and so I'm really proud, you know, for, to be human because we, we managed to advance technology so much that we can you know, scan, we can zoom in into some a, a, a piece in history like 14 billion years ago or something. But I'm also ashamed to be human because we, uh, we really suck in some things and we've been, uh, we've been one of the uh, sixth extinction, causes of sixth extinction, mass extinction on planet. We are really ecocide species we destroyed 40% of the insect species and uh, half of the wildlife in only the last 40 years. So it's really scary what we do. And this is just an animation in open land map. You can see the tropical forest disappearing in Brazil over the last uh, 30 years. Data set produced here by the colleagues from Wageningen and by the say, Hilda Plus. So I'm really also ashamed. And so I would like to change that. This is the real map of the world. The one on the left, you know, it's not a geographical. This is the real map of the world in trillions of dollars. Uh, we are now first time in history, we are the human species is above 100 trillion um, dollars. Um, the biggest players, the United States for a couple of more years and then it will be China. Um, and you see that's 100, we are 100 trillion dollar economy globally. The cost of stopping global warming is 50 trillion. So it's, it's not so bad, you know, uh, if you distribute it over maybe 20 years, I mean, it's not so bad. Imagine everybody gives, so imagine this is your money, and now from your money you give 5% to stop uh, climate change. I mean, it's not, doesn't sound so scary. The problem is if you go to ask for 5%, somebody in Africa or somebody in Belgium, you know, it's a different thing, of course. Um, so, but just to give an idea, we have to get better in, in financial analysis, understanding 
how does something that we map, how does that relate into value, into currency, into gains and losses and risk, etc. cetera. Um, also very shameful that we are now almost 100 years since the people discovered that CO2 is causing uh, global warming, almost 100 years that it's been discovered, we are still uh, emitting more and more CO2. So this doesn't sound good. Uh, users, um, people have to be central to the uh, designing the system. Uh, and my colleague Ishanish is going to talk about it. I don't want to jump into this, but we put our system really much connected to uh, users, user groups, user communities, and also organizations. So we really want to develop this very closely, working close to also with the European Space Agency and their initiatives, uh, and especially with the Geo Secretariat and UN organizations. Um, so yeah, that's why we have a two work packages also dedicated only to that. And uh, we are hoping that uh, this, this project is going to be driven uh, and it is going to be on the end something that the users will come from this day uh, in four years they will come. This is really what, you know, you did stuff that really, uh, that managed to help us fill our gaps and managed to make uh, our projects more run smoothly. So you develop something really useful. Um, land restoration starts with spatial intelligence. Now, spatial intelligence, there is something in, uh, in psychology called spatial intelligence, but I use it now in different contexts, so I just have to clarify. I don't mean here by spatial intelligence, the psychological, but I mean by geospatial or GS intelligence. So that's the capacity to generate spatial information, uh, optimize spatial designs, uh, navigate people and objects, estimate risk, and simulate predict outcomes of different scenarios. That's my definition, by the way. So don't uh, don't Google it. Uh, where did I get it from? It's my definition, but I hope you agree. Um, so what helps boost spatial intelligence? Uh, well, fast data access, uh, prediction based on the best possible input data, high spatial accuracy, uh, data relevance of data for decisions, um, and then uh, having a feedback loop so that you very quickly, if there's a, a remark or there's a revision either, that you can very quickly rerun analysis and improve the predictions. Um, we are also super happy that European Commission uh, on the end decided to fund uh, two projects in our call. Uh, and uh, we will, of course, it's very uh, tight competition, as you know, for European funding, but we are very happy that European Commission decided also to fund the EO for EU, and very happy to have the project coordinator uh, started after FT, uh, <laughs> Haji Aftimiades. I'm so sorry, the winner, of the, the winner of the quiz is the one that managed to pronounce your name. Uh, but uh, I'm, very, I'm very happy to have you here with us, and uh, we are looking forward to interacting with you. The competition time is over, now it's time for collaboration. Um, and you see, you don't need a Mediterranean country to have a Mediterranean climate anymore, uh, which is uh, fortunate and unfortunate also. Um, and also, uh, I should mention that we are also in contact with the um, uh, Land Carbon Lab. Uh, it's a very similar project also with the similar goals, also making global data sets. And we have contact with them, and that's why we have one of the keynotes, Matt Hansen, who's going to connect. Uh, he was supposed to come in person, but uh, things changed. Uh, but he's going to connect and he's going to give us also a talk. And we would we are also looking forward to collaborating with them. Um, yes, uh, today we picked up, uh, um, I think, uh, almost 12 keynotes. Uh, we have a demo session. It's a real exciting day. Uh, we are looking forward to uh, uh, discussions. Uh, we're looking forward to the last section. There will be some spicy questions about why European Commission wouldn't use, for example, Google Earth Engine. What's the problem there? So there will be some spicy questions, and let's uh, let's talk honestly and uh, let's discuss things. Um, and um, and after that, we will uh, make a report and we will release the videos uh, with the DOI under Open Data License uh, that you can also watch uh, or most of the talks. And with this thing, I would just like to thank, especially here, Danius, uh, for uh, helping organize everything. He did an amazing amount of work. It takes a lot of preparation for just one day of conference, it takes about three weeks of preparation. So thank you, Daniels and Wach University team. Also, we have our uh, accounting uh, uh, financial advisor company, uh, Bibi, here with us. She also helped a lot with the project. So thank you so much over the years for helping. And unfortunately, our, our chair, OpenJob chair, he's retiring slowly this year. So he, was, uh, he wanted to come in Netherlands, but it didn't work out. It's difficult these days to travel. 
so he's also sending his best regards. And with this thing, um, I would just like to also thank to my team. Uh, we are now officially a deep tech team, which is dominantly run by female intelligence. Uh, and it's not, not because we forced it, because the, the ladies did the best on the test. We do tests when we hire people. So they did the best on the test. So and we're really proud to be now a um, deep tech company with a um, dominantly female power. And with this thing, I stop my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Let's just start with the top question. Um, has three likes. Great. How can we close the gap between existing tools and stakeholders and users? Most of the time, the users don't even know about what's available. Amazing question, getting at the heart of this workshop. So um, let's let's just yeah. start with that so, question. So I think that, so. The question is like why why users don't know about you know things that are already awesome and they could use to solve problems. So I think that's if I understand it correctly. Um, yeah, so you cannot blame users for not knowing about your software, about your tool. I mean, it's, that doesn't work. So, so I think um, I would just say maybe, yeah, you have to invest into making it more easy to understand or use, uh, making um, ex visual explanations, making tutorials, um, and then diversifying the uh, how people can access. So one one example is if you make in R a package. And, and people don't use R, you know, that's a problem. But if you make what Edza told me, you make an API, then uh, you can serve some functionality with, to people that are language agnostic. So, um, so that's maybe two, two ways you can make things more accessible that already exist. I fully agree if, if you have things that are already, you know, working fine, you don't need a, a new system or or, or, or redesign, you know, you just need to make sure that people can understand, fine understand and, and have a visual explanation in sense of a tutorial or video tutorial that they understand how they can use it very quickly, not, not that they have to go do a master degree at, at university or something. Other uh, questions? Um, let's see. What I think... part of OEMC are you most excited about personally? I see that's trending. Um, that's a nice. That's a nice question. I'm excited about lots of stuff, so uh, it's difficult now to pick up. Uh, but I definitely like the human power in the uh, in the in the project. So I'm really excited to have all this leading, uh, leading, especially leading uh, uh, from the point of science. So leading uh, uh, scientists coming together and. And I'm also very excited that we will make things open. So it will be a, a genuine open open data, open source project. So that's my personally biggest excitement. Okay. Thank you, Tom. I think that's all okay. we have time for right now.